some of the stuff that I really dug while well, digging digging into your, into uh, maybe the last couple months of your stuff, I guess, was um. Let's see. Basically, how you attribute it to a BDSM, like a mass flagellation, if you will, just like it almost. It is. It's. It's. It's masochistic the way. Please tell me how to think. You know, basically down to that level. I I missed what you were referring to as masochistic. A BDSM, or? like a mass BDSM, like. Oh actual the, the, the lockdown and all this stuff well basically yeah basically how and i've only heard a couple other people refer to it specifically in that way and it's like ryan gable's one of them you're the other yeah i think i think within many people there's a, a need to be punished uh i think in western people the more society becomes affluent the more less problems people have in their lives and the more wealthier they become but the more likely they are to have the subconscious desire to be punished somehow. And I saw this, I used to work on Wall Street as a graphic designer and communications consultant. And I heard stories about these SM, BDSM brothels that were down in lower Manhattan, where these like millionaire investment bankers, multimillionaire investment bankers could pay for anything. And you would have like, uh, there would be, you know the madams would be dressed up as nazis and they'd gas them in gas chambers and put them in little and i was laughing my head off saying that's not true because i thought they were just winding up this guy from ireland or you know it, 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 you know very very wealthy african-american guys would want to be treated like, like you were enslaved oh yeah and, and i was like that is not true at all i don't believe it and uh, i thought they were just winding up this like this guy from ireland because they thought i'd be i'd be you no know, easy to take the piss out of and so, but I just laughed at Then I saw a documentary years later on the BBC and they actually featured this place and that's exactly what was going on. And the madam who ran the brothel said, these guys have so much money, they have no worries in life. They have no difficulties in life. They can afford the best doctors, the best insurance, the best health treatment. So they have a subconscious desire to seek out suffering, almost like to atone for how easy their lives are. Now, in the last 20 years, the standard of living, well, the last in the West has gone up tremendously. I know countries like the United States is difficult because you guys were so far ahead of, say, Western Europe that, you know, you, you had it easy for a long time. And then the last 20 years, you started to kind of go down a bit. But for like Western Europe and a lot of Europe since the fall of this, the Soviet Union and the, 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 the growth of the European Union, the standard of living here has gone very, very high. And most European countries have experienced this growth in affluence, especially here in Ireland, uh, where, you know, we suddenly went from being a poor country in the 80s to the richest country in the world now. And those, so I think this is a lot of that has to do with suburbia. People have no, no, um, no worries in life, no nothing. And this thing comes along and you have the mask thing. You have this, this, this bondage thing, this slave thing, you know. My mouth is closed. And I can't breathe. This kind of thing. The social distancing is very kinky. Don't come near me. Stay away. M watch those lines. Ha you know, signs all over the country saying this is two meters so six feet, whatever it is in the United States. And, uh, a lot of this kind of, and you must obey. You must abide these rules. And I think a lot of them are subconsciously being turned on sexually by it. I think it's a sexual thing for many of them, particularly males. Partic I think a lot of males are turned on by it. And you do get that kind of thing too. And also coupled with the political correctness thing where they've tried to kind of like destroy human sexuality. You would have, you know, this whole thing of the, you know, like in, they say in Islamic world, you have the veil, the whole thing of the, you know, it's, there's an allure there in this. Well, you have Western women now in an age where it's like, you know, where, you know, in a, an age of woke, that that's kind of fitting the same thing too. So I think there's a, a yes, I absolutely believe there's a sexual element in terms of suffering and masochism regarding the lockdown and how it affected people and i think the more I, I think that's why you're more likely to see mass compliance among the comfortable middle classes in fact they were the ones and upper middle classes they were the ones who wanted the lockdowns the most the restrictions the most because they were being turned on by it they were actually being turned on by it and uh, i think yeah i think that was actually a deep-rooted freudian impulse to Absolutely. uh overcome a sense of subconscious guilt regarding how easy their lives are was fulfilled with the restrictions. 
And so oh, this actually, this reminds me of the question I wanted to ask you was this self-hatred thing that they've been marketing to us over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> Clearly that's related to this, this self-hate of, of wanting to cover ourselves up and not connect with our, our fellow man. And yeah. it's this process of trauma and trauma and trauma and trauma until we're so traumatized that we have a separation of our soul. Yeah, well, you see, like in the Gulf War too. You remember those shots that came from from that prison where they had, uh, I think her name was Lydia England. She was a private, and those Islamic or fellows they caught in combat in Iraq, naked on the ground, and they were all they showed like this prison where they're being interrogating them, and they had members of the U.S. military, and they were all around these Islamic or I well, say Arabic prisoners who were all naked. Now that that was the same thing. They were kind of like they they it was to if you strip them down to their souls and you make them afraid of their own, each other, and ultimately our soul is our connection to another human being, you will kill any sense, you will smash open their, their world to a point where they will create a dissociative area within their brain. And in that area, that dissociative area, the interrogator tells them, you're a piece of shit, you must betray, like we saw, there's an incredible, there's a credible story of when, the, when Americans were caught, troops were caught in the Vietnam, sorry, the Korean War, they were taken to Chinese interrogation camps. And then these fellows were coming back like, you know, regular, like reg American, you know, normal apple pie kind of guys from the Midwest or whatever, sitting on, coming on American TV and saying things like, uh, the communist revolution will overtake the United States, the United States is evil. And they had just been brainwashed and, they, and the Chinese had just used methods of destroying their self-identity and then filling, creating a partition of true dissociation. And that partition of association then becomes the place where the new reality lives. Right. And that's what they've done to them. And they've made them feel like the ritualistic washing, this kind of nonsense, you know, that's very religious. A lot of this comes from like uh, things like Orthodox Catholicism, the whole thing of like genuflecting and blessing yourself. You see that in many rosary beads and all this kind of thing. And you get that in like some Eastern religions as well, like Islam and like in particular Shiite Islam. And, and that's also, there's also a self-flagellation to that thing. They have the flagellants within Catholicism and you have similar things in Shia Muslims where they bash themselves with swords and stuff like that until they bleed. And there's a lot of that kind of thing. I'm bad, I'm diseased, I've got the coronavirus. So they, they really tapped into the archetypal core of the human being, you know, like they got right, right, root, right in their root one. And they, uh, they've taken these people and they've re-engineered them or they use their favorite word at the moment, reimagined. They've reimagined what it is to be a person. It's weird because the way you just broke it down, it like cre creates a s certain partition, right? Yeah. Feels like it's like a. I think Jason Horsley touched on it in Prisoner of Infinity, really well. I don't know if you checked that. Have you by chance looked into that? No, I haven't seen it, but I, I, it's well known since the MK Ultra stuff came out in right. the U.S. Senate when they had those hearings. I think it was the Rockefellers or the Kennedys, and one of them blew open the whole CIA thing on MK Ultra. A lot of those experiments are done in Canada, so they wouldn't be actually in yeah. violation of the US law. And they were top of the idea of the dissociation of the brain, that the trauma creates a, a partition in the brain. Right. And they took it to a, 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 a level. This is why the CIA are very heavily interested, and not only CIA, but also particularly the French Secret Service, a very interesting cults and flying saucer cults and doomsday cults and any kind of cult where an event is supposed to come along. Those things, and a lot of these cults are actually fronts, like the, the most famous thing, the Solar Temple in Switzerland, <laughs> and that where they had those mass suicides at the end, where you all kill themselves. That was all filled with people who exactly be the type you call the Karens today, the, the, the mainstream normies. Uh, that's what the was most amazing thing when they, you know, fellas who took out guns and shot their own kids dead and stuff like that because they were given orders. And then when anyone tried to investigate, it was Swiss and French police. Like one, one compound in Switzerland and one compound in France all committed mass suicide on the same day. But when, the, when, you, when you read about these guys, they were just normal families and people and the kind of people you see next door. But what they learned all these things to, that have now led us to where we are at the mass through their infiltration and, and control of these cults like the Solar Temple. So this is, what we're seeing now is the end of a very long process of got to this point. 
For sure. And it, one thing I want to touch on, though, that I feel like Jason brings up a really good point, and it kind of just all adds to the shedding shedding light on it, basically, is like the Freudian, that partition then takes on a guardianship role, basically, to protect, like a motherly protection of your now dissociated state, basically. So once the, once the, this is like how the pathology works. I, I'm, I'm butchering his words, obviously. Um, but he attributed, he attributes it to that. And Kripal seems to do that too, breaking into Streber's stuff. Cause he goes back and finds out that secret school nonsense and then writes the BDSM pain on, uh, it came on like 2013, like a short story. I mean, I'm familiar, I'm not into kink shaming, like do your thing, whatever. Right. But there's a, there's like a certain line. I mean, obviously with certain shit. Um, but, uh, I think with the whole, it's, 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 it's hard to, because it is so, because it's fracturing your, our psyches in, on such a mass level, right? All at the same time with the same undercurrent of like doom counter on the television, little triggers right throughout the day. That everybody's seeing, everybody's just processing, you know, it's just just a, that current being open, if you will, right, is just carrying so much darkness and it's such a heavy, awful. I know I'm not touching on anything we don't already know, but I mean, basically, what would you say to people that are like coming to this from, because I'm finding a lot of friends stumbling into my area that have zero political interest. They want to maintain, like, they're artists and shit. Right, they're the people that I was, ho- was hoping would speak yeah. up, but now we're the ones speaking up, and it's weird. Oh, fuck it, got to, right? Like, if there's no other time, this is the time. Uh, so, what would you say? Because they they see a right bent angle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I know yeah. you're you're hit like to tons of. <laughs> you guys have no idea. This man is a is a beast seriously like with your deep dives into the occult like with the the uh the jack parsons documentary that was awesome that was really good really well put together thank you um yeah so i mean what would you say to people that are like just kind of stumbling in and they hear you and they're like well that might that's a little bit too but you bring up such a good point that they catch themselves you know what i'm saying because there's t- a lot of people out there like that right now. I really f- feel that way because I know there are. I ran into them yesterday. Well, you can't really change them, and that's the unfortunate thing about it. I mean, and the thing with the artists and stuff being the most, the strictest vanguards and, you know, Gestapo of the actual or- or orthodoxy, that's a very interesting process that that's happened in the past. That happened in the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union happened, the 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 Bolsheviks gave enormous amount of work to um to artists uh, and created even created like artistic movements like the deconstructivist and the constructivist to actually help promote the revolution and artists were were you know the, the Bolsheviks understood very early on that the the usefulness of artists in pushing across this 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 new political system and part of that was the destruction of this psyche which withheld the old czarist Russia together. And that's, a, that's what's happening here. It, it, artists are less affected uh, by, especially if they're like, you know, I'm not talking about like someone who's like a landscape painter. I'm talking about somebody who's actually, uh, you know, uh, gone into the world of the artist's way of thinking, you know, creative force in terms of songwriting, painting, whatever, sculpture. And what they, are the first to know that something is not right, but they're also the first to know that they can actually use it. And this is what happens. And that's what the, the, these, you know, so it's like when you see someone like Ian Brown or, or Van Morrison or Eric Clapton coming out and saying this whole thing is bullshit, the artists don't just ignore them, they actually attack them. And they attack them because subconsciously they know that they're these the, 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 these are guys that are from the old guard, and they're a danger to us actually being able to make money from the new order, mm. for the, the new order. These layers, so, so many and layers. A lot of that goes on. 
and uh, like I know a lot of artistic friends and I would say it's not too bad. Uh, what sh- I'll tell you what shocked me the most was people I, I, I know people who, now I wouldn't have been anti-vaccine if in a, any philosophical way. I know people who are a member of the anti-vaccine lobby, you know, and classic anti-vaxxers and they're all rolling up their sleeves right now. It's insane. To get this, 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 this one. And this, to me, I cannot get my head around. No, they're not, and they're not, and it's almost like they're robots. They've been spellbound, and by the the simple hysteria and the mainstream media, it, it whipped up about this whole nonsense a year and a half ago, and to see how they've switched out completely to the other side. In the past, I would have been, I would have been the one that the sat there and said to them, you know. You know, with some vaccines, you know, they 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 def, like polio. They definitely are real. They do work. And we've had inoculations when we were kids, and we, you know, we're okay. You know, so some do work. You know, things like rubella and all those. And, and then they say, no, no, all vaccines are bad. All vaccines are deadly. They're the first ones now who are rolling up their sleeves yeah. for this Pfizer one. It's, it's almost like this is the whole thing. On I talk about the, the the reality splitting in two, that there's something happening to the human race. And we're like, you know, it's invasion of the body snatchers. And guys like us and people like us are almost like the ones who didn't get the alien inside us. And we're like, what the hell? I mean, John Waters, I don't know if you know him. He's a, he was once a very famous journalist. He still is very famous in Ireland. He's been on the forefront of attacking this whole thing on, our, and, you know, on our side. From the, and he even mentioned on a show the other night, and, you know, he would have been from a mainstream journalist background. And he's even said on a show the other night, it's invasion of the body snatchers. I, I, I really, I'm starting to believe people I have known who changed so radically, particularly people who would have been leftist or liberal, are now, you know, talking about how wonderful corporations like Pfizer yeah. and Johnson and Johnson are, and and Amazon even. They're even praising Amazon for being so fantastic, helping us out to get us stuff delivered and things like this. He said, he said it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if we found out tomorrow that an alien force had landed on this planet and taken taken most of humanity over. And I know something, I'm only half joking when I say that, because I tell you something, at this point in time, I wouldn't be surprised either. No, I think that's brilliant. Gordon, I think you had something you want to touch on with that, right? So, yeah, I was, I've been thinking about that a lot. The, because, uh, um, Thomas, are you familiar with Rogue Ways? How do you spell it? Rogue Ways, Lindsay Sharman's show. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. So we've been doing a lot of stuff on kind of the uh, the the end game of this, and she, Lindsay has a lot of um a lot of research into the like the prion disease, and I'm I'm really thinking that that's where this is heading. And I wanted to see what you thought of that. Well, tell like, me if that. you've looked into that. No, I'd like to hear what that's about. Tell me what that's about, Gordy. So, prion disease is um, where your brain basically eats itself. It's the that cannibal disease okay, where yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Now? The precursor okay. to Madco. So well, there's a there's a connection with the so the vaccines yeah. and that kind of thing. We pronounce it differently in Ireland, yeah, but I know what you mean. It actually, the neurology starts to eat itself and dissolve itself. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, the changes have been so strange in people that I, would anybody be surprised if they were changed at the neurological, something was happening at the neurological level? You know, I certainly wouldn't be. Uh, uh, to see people's personality changes and uh, to see that um, the fear, I mean, a flight this is another thing too, a flight, a fight or flight primal fear. This is something that's quite disturbs me about these people as well. They have a look of absolute terror in their eyes when you try to explain to them, oh, listen, this is not, as, this is not what it's all made out to be. And it's very easy to see that it's not all made out to be. Yes, there probably is a coronavirus. Yes, people, older people and people of HIV and you know cancer patients, they are definitely under risk and they should be taken care of. But there's no reason to lock up the whole world for uh, something that has a 1% right. mortality rate for most people, if even that. How dare and they allow the tiniest bit of optimism? What I see is a look of terror in their eyes. Yeah. 
absolute terror, fear. Like you told them that, you know, that their, their parents who weren't, who weren't who their parents were or something like that. It's literally that level of terror, you know, and uh, like you've taken away their whole life and they don't seem to have, this is a weird, you mentioned neurology now, right? They don't seem to have a memory before this happened. Right. Yeah. That's it's amnesia. It's like a collective amnesia. There was no world before March 20, March 2020. But, and that goes back to the, the trauma thing. Every time uh, you, this I know from personal experience is that you lose time. When trauma yeah. happens, it's like stuff gets reset and your brain has to make sense of that. And you have, to, you have to take it at wherever you are because yeah. you're starting from scratch because your brain just can't handle it. Yeah, I read together years. I ago. read books years ago. I read a book years ago. I wish I could remember the title, but it was it was recollections of World War II by German soldiers, uh, just talking about their personal experience about the battles were like and stuff. And these were all young guys when they went off to war. And we talk about things like Operation Barbarossa in the Eastern Front, and they would so many would say the same things. They could not remember the battle. The you know, they, they would, they, they, the battle would, they would go into battle. They'd fight these for two or three days, these horrific carnage things against the Red Army. And when the thing was over, all they could remember was getting ready and then relaxing afterwards, being mm -hmm. being in hospital afterwards. They could not remember the trauma. And, and that was actually portrayed in that movie, Saving Private Ryan. There's a scene in it where Tom Hanks goes into an alternate time zone. Did you ever see that? There's yeah. a scene where there's carnage on the beach at normandy and all of a sudden it's he goes into another time zone where things are in slow motion and stuff that's the you that, that this is like this we're going to very kind of you know way out kind of not way out not the way out but this has been commonly reported in extreme combat situations where they they don't remember and it also happens to people who emigrate this is another weird one people who emigrate and leave their old country behind or their old you know especially they go in, in, nowadays it's not so bad but before airlines when you when you emigrate that was the end of it you know you never came back they would they would forget all the details of their private previous life except for say a song you know like or a song they knew or you know or, 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 if, they, if they stopped writing to their friends in ireland or italy or germany they went to america after a few years if you asked them what was it like growing up in italy ireland or germany and say i can't really remember and that seems to be what's happening now with these people before March 2020 as a wipe, a screen wipe of the brain. Yeah. It's like the amygdala can't handle it. It's yeah. been over. Like we were talking about naming the episode. I was like, well, rage fatigue, compassion fatigue. We're all suffering from that. I feel like as a collective. Um, yeah. And I feel like that what you just described is a possible like symptom side effect of that fatigue if you will, like a shell shock almost, not just the fatigue. Well, well, the shell shock was the initial global lockdown where every, you know, that was back in March, 2020. That was, that even affected me, you know, like that, especially like I can remember that when it affected me. I it feel was like, like you, you need to make this known too, because there is a huge divide here in America. We didn't have anywhere near to what you, you went through over there. I mean, and I don't even mean to like blow it all up like that but it's true like we didn't yeah. have go ahead we weren't allowed we weren't allowed to for a long time to travel more than 1.5 kilometers that is insane i cannot okay you guys I mean, you would sorry. freak out we would all be army checks at the major roads to say that ask you what you would do and say well i'm going into town to get my groceries there's loads of videos on of irish people on, on YouTube telling the police and to get stuff and you know calling them names and uh, you know uh, you, you, ha you know and I don't watch mainstream TV but you say something like I didn't know and they say don't you watch TV no I don't I don't watch I don't know what was on the news and they, they look funny at you but they, they say what I'm getting groceries or I need something from the heart but at one point there was nothing open but grocery stores and that's it and, and uh, a pharmacist that was it and that went on for a long time and then you have the 1.5 kilometer long lockdown. And that was ridiculous. And um, 
you, you know, they got on a train, they would arrest you. They got on a, you know, unless you had like a really good, you had like, you know, it was like, and this, this is a country that was like very free, you know, like we never had, we never had a police state here really ever. And overnight, bam, a police state like that. And, uh, and again, lots of them loved it. Lots of them, they just loved the security of knowing they couldn't travel further down the, the park down the road or, you know, the bus stop up the, over there. They absolutely loved the, the formal the, nature of it, the regimental nature of it. Turning over that last little bit of what they had already submitted anyway, right? Let's be realistic. Like they'd already given, like, all right, now just think for me completely. Just, I'm, an, you know, automate me. Right, like that's what it's just like. Give up, automate, automate me. That's it. You, you nailed it perfectly with that. I never. That's it. Congratulations. That's you nailed it beautifully, David. Automate me. That's Turn what the name is. Episode. Automate. automate me. There you go. And, and when everything is when everything is known, and all regimentation and protocol is very clear and laid out, weak people are very happy because they. I was talking to a friend here when I first went down. And she was saying to me, and it was, it was the early days of when we really started to think about the NPC thing. And she said to me, do you ever notice that like, if you've been in the company of people and they're looking at what you're doing and they copy it? And I said, yeah. And she says, that's because they, have, they don't have the, the intuitive abilities to figure it out themselves. So they will, they, will, they will look at somebody else to see how they do it so they can learn how to do it themselves rather than like you know if, if you put them in front of a knife and fork a spoon and a fork in front of them for the first time obviously the fork is prongs it's for sticking into things right the, the, the spoon is like a little ladle it's for picking up liquids right they wouldn't know that they would have to wait until they see someone else doing it. oh that's what the fork does oh that's what the roundy one does and she was absolutely right when she said that and these people are much more numerous than we realize, much more numerous. And the result is that the governments gave them the perfect life. They knew exactly when to wake up, when to go to bed, how far they could go, what they should do, who they should see. And I'll give you a classic example of it. I, in front of my place is a cycle path pathway that mainly kids use to go to school. Otherwise, the odd adult would use it now and again. When the lockdown first came here, the government said, you must remain indoors permanently, but you can go for a walk with one other person from your household for 30 minutes. They actually started walking for 30 minutes, not because they always exercised, but because the government said, and suddenly it was like there were thousands of people on this, on this, on this pathway that had never exercised or walked in their lives. Why? Because the government had said, you can now, you can now walk on, you know, go walk for 30 minutes. And they were getting, they'd have their dinner at 7, 7.30. They'd get, we must do our 30 minute walk. What? And it, that, I was like, we were like looking at these people and going, you know, fucking robots. You know, that, that's what they are. Fucking robots, that's the word that the I was using. And that was what started me doing the, the Corona Chronicles thing. It was like trying to get my head around it. Have I been really all my life surrounded by these flesh robots? Right. It's like everything turned into like a fucking yeah, like David a, Lynch movie type clarity, thing. Clarity came in. You know, clarity came in. I've been given most human beings far too much credit. You know, it, isn't ahead. it amazing how just before this, like the whole zombie thing like blew up? Yeah. yeah like yeah, like The Walking Dead really neatly. was huge just before all this bullshit happened. Like, At the end the NPC thing blew up on a right. what's that channel four, four whatever it's called and, mm -hmm. yeah four, an a chan right but like a, a year before it the NPC thing was videos about there was you I mean there was there was yeah. people just on Reddit some fantastic discussions there was some great reading but I, I I remember watching reading these articles and these these discussions with my jaw hanging open and then it becomes manifest. Yes, it was very strange, Gordy. Very oh, no, strange. Man. It was like a snap too. It was like all of a sudden now it's it's not like just twenty percent. And then it's almost like those of us who are paying attention were being made aware of an mm -hmm. advanced archetype, and then the mm -hmm. archetype manifested. Right. It's like when we hear those stories when you were tell, telling that a minute ago, Thomas. This just had to cross my mind. Of course, 
is when you hear those stories about the UF, like the men in black and they come and you know what I mean? And they're like, it's like, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to use a fork and a knife. It's, it feels like, like that, that's, that's what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm attributing yeah. it to that. That's right. That John Keel in his book, he talks yeah. about the that brilliant book by the men in black. They go into restaurants in Manhattan and they wouldn't know what to order. So the waitress would say, yeah, have a nice steak. And they'd, they'd, the waitress would bring a steak and they'd be trying to cut it with a spoon. Yeah. Or it's, picking it's, it up. Yes. It's it went like, from the strange to the straight up absurd. Like yeah. in two two point two seconds. Like it's just those books are great to dig into. But I mean I think that's a way like we can kind of uh I'm not necessarily saying put in a box, but it's we can you know, it's a reference frame, you know, to try and make some sense of this shit. Because it's yes. the, 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 this it, it it can't be just mind control. That's the whole thing that gets me. Right. If it was just mind control uh, you could stay, you could you could rationalize it, but it goes beyond mind control. There's they have an emotional investment here. And that's why I find the most disturbing of all. They they've fallen in love with the lockdown. They've fallen in love with the mask. They've fallen in love with the protocols, and that to me is goes beyond mind control. Because if you look at if you see people that have been mind controlled by cults or by the military or whatever. They, there's something absent there. There's, a, there's a, a, a loss of personality integration or something. They don't have that. They have now, instead of that, they, 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 they are filled with joy talking about their uh, oppression. Right. They're like evacuated, right? Of like soul. Yeah. And that's exactly, um, that's, that was what I was going to bring up again, was this separation of soul. This is what cults, this is what, as a former military contractor, this is what the brainwashing does. It separates you from your soul. And you're, when you're traumatized in that, when that's happening, like I, I'm convinced that this is the point of all of it is to separate ourselves from our souls. Yeah. I, I, and what's your thoughts of that? Well, do you, you know, the nearest thing I could compare it to is there, have you ever met an alcoholic, like a really bad alcoholic or, um, or, or a heroin or a heroin in Wisconsin? <laughs> I, I, I'm not putting down people as alcoholics or uh, drug addicts. I don't, yeah. that's, I'm not putting them down. But the ones who become born again Christians. Oh, mm-hmm. Tripping for God, that, tripping for Jesus. That, yeah, that's yeah. the one. That's what they like today, the Normans. That's what they're all mm-hmm. like. What they, uh, what Todd Ned Flanders' kid said on, this, on The Simpsons years ago there's a difference, you know, Dad, we were finally happy and not just church happy. Right. And so yeah. that's what I see in them church happy. The church veneer. happy. I mean, I, you know, I know, I know fellas who were like really bad heroin addicts or really bad coke heads, and they suddenly discovered they had the, some they were some Pentecostal church somewhere. I've got their hands on them or something like that. My biological and dad. That's the case. They're the only they're the only archetype I could compare the normies to right now. That's heavy. Well, it's part of that addiction thing. Like they've got us so addicted to something that we have to replace that addiction with something else. Yeah, like Filling that. that's what. That's what AA is for. So you can replace that. There you go. That thing you you replace your addiction to alcohol or or NA for uh, narcotics. You would you replace it with that other cult. Yeah, felt that's too what crunchy. it is. It's a cult. Yeah. Now yeah. I know, you know, some people, a lot of people get a lot of help out of that cult. Yeah. So I'm not saying that those cults are terrible. Just like the Christian Church, you know, it's not fellowship evil. you know it's yeah. fellowship you need yeah, that i get it but we're we're just exchanging one addiction for another and just get free of all that bullshit yeah. you're gonna be know, so much better off it's the bleeding well, heart in you gordon i love you recovered from alcoholism or heroin or you know crack or anything like that the ones who seem to recover the best are the ones who've done it without religion they have kind of, you know, and, 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 and I would include AA in the religion part of that as well. Now, I know mm-hmm. AA helps a lot of people, but it still has a kind of a, a churchy vibe to it. And so, and it is, you know, replay, it does, you know, it, as you said, like it, it, it's done through some Christian church. Yeah, it's great that the guy is not like, you know, downtown sucking off guys in bus stations for his <laughs> next heroin fix. That's a good thing. Okay. But at the same time, if he's replaced the heroin with Jesus, you know, yeah. 
it's it's not a cure. Now it's, you got it, a junkie on Jesus. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm, he's I'm made the one, a bunch more lives way more miserable. Yeah, and the one, <laughs> and the ones I know who did it without any of that stuff are the ones who actually went on to have creative, you know, better lives. You know, because they they didn't replace the addiction; they just they went to war against it. Basically, they had, they had no choice. You know. Yeah. And, you get and, sick and, and tired of being sick and tired. Exactly, and these ones today, which is the I, I, I have normies who are have they replaced the addiction for modern society modern culture western culture have they replaced that addiction with this new pro this new covid protocol mm-hmm. it feels damn yeah. snug doesn't it it's a yeah, snug glove yeah they haven't done the work on themselves you know because if they did very it's like very quickly you would see it's bullshit you know i mean uh, it, it, there's a one percent you know and, and you cannot reach them you know when you see these people say things like oh my husband you know that you know that that guy that there's a doctor in america who was boasting about like was making fun of conspiracy theorists after he got a second Moderna shot, saying things like "I'm now under control of the Illuminati," and everyone laughing. And the next day, he dropped dead from the from the from the vaccine. And there's his wife saying things like "I'm proud of him," and it shouldn't put people off it. And we see this over and over again. You know, if I had if look if, if my one of my fam- nearest and dearest died of that, like you know. I'd be on the newspapers going bonkers saying, Who do, I, I, want the, I want blood from these yeah, people exactly. who put this drug. No, 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 they're proud. They're proud of that their husband or their daughter or their sister. The yeah, they're proud of it. And, and it shouldn't stop the rest of you from being self, self-slaughtering. Yeah, don't think, don't question shit. Just run in arm first. Oh, man. I mean, yep. I have people that are like, straight edge vegan before that was like a thing you know where vegan where you can actually see that there's like an agenda there now you know this was before this was mid 90s early 90s to late 90s kind of thing those cats are they're still vegan but they're talking about well i'm not they would be the first ones to be like fuck all big pharma like you know what i mean like punk not anymore punk man rock all the punks are dead. Yeah, it's all the really punks are, are sold out, man. It's really weird. Oh yeah, like oh, well, I came, but I that was my child. That was my early teenage years. I yeah. came out of the team and That's all well, of us. No, that's us. Yeah. When I think when I think of the characters I knew then, and when I see people who call themselves punks now, there was some shithead. I think it was in Australia. Was said he was only he was going to charge vaccinated people a thousand dollars extra to come to a show or something like that. I remember that. That was dirty. You know, going on uh, now you know like and, and 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 real punks like steve jones and uh john 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 lyden if they turn down they're attacked now universally attacked for being themselves haven't changed you know right I, I, ooh, it's, how dare I just, you be true to you true to what that how dare you be true to what you preach chris stein gave me shit one day on facebook from blondie uh, and he posted a photograph of Debbie Harry and uh, Hillary Clinton, and I just <laughs> said back, "Look, it, this is not this is this is not where we came from. We didn't come, from, right. you know, our generation didn't come from. We we avoided politicians like they had their cancer." That and wasn't Lockman, was it? Uh, who was it? That wasn't Lockman, Gary Lockman. No, no, it was oh. uh, Chris Stein from Blondie. Okay, Chris. He okay, posted a picture of his wife Debbie Harry with. Hillary Clinton. Oh, and he's like, he goes, he goes, he goes, Thomas, what, what do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. blah this kind of thing. Uh, uh, people were allowed that just because we were punks once doesn't mean we're allowed to have a political opinion. And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel very uncomfortable about this. You know, right. you feel I dirty. Talk, yeah, I just, this doesn't seem wrong. And uh, the unfortunate thing was that everyone sided with him because, well, he's a celebrity, you know. And I mean, it was just, it, was, it wasn't just that it was a picture of his wife. Debbie Harry were a politician, but it was it was it was partisan. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's wonderful. Everything she represents is it's wonderful, and that's what bothered me. That part, that part bothered me. Yeah, and it, you know, I gotta call it out because I j- it just popped ran through my mind. I don't remember Muse. I mean, they're still huge, right? Mm-hmm. I really I like them. I think they're like a modern day Queen. I can't help it. I just their arena rock. They have catchy stuff. Whatever. The early stuff was pretty solid. Anyway, I remember they only had a couple links on their page, their website, for so many years, and it was Prison Planet forever until about twenty. 
I don't know, probably around like 2014, I think, like they just left it off. Then I remember seeing Matt, a photo of Matt Bellamy with Hillary Clinton and his like whoever, Kate Hudson, after Kate Hudson, some model girl he's dating. I'm just like, dude, you've talked like, but what am I supposed to think? You're on the same level as like John Legend. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, wor- you're the tours are insane that those, that that band goes on, you know, like they're multi-million dollar, but. Well, they're... they know what side their the right. bread is buttered on though. But I they're mean, also at that level of success, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to be keeping but that level of kicking. success if they don't sell out. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you can't, they, they, you can't go on tour with you too and continue to call you. yourself. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that's a valid point. I should just yeah. shut up. Yeah. Just shut up. They were supposed supposedly on the ground. They went on tour with you too. I mean, they that's were on Capitol it. Records from the beginning, like Warner. So, what does that say? It's not like they were on some small indie label or something and actually made good. Mm-hmm. You know, they're great musicians. I get it, and I understand and appreciate that. Other than that, I don't know. But it's just weird. They're they're massive. They're just huge. So they were at least getting people thinking. I at least have to draw a few positives. I don't baby bath water shit. You know. I mean, certain things. Well, it's but, like Sting, like with the synchronicity stuff. Like that was starting to get into some cool mystical stuff back in the day. Like that was my introduction to synchroni- what synchronicity actually is. Yeah. And that, like the police, you know, yeah. like that was some cool shit. And then Sting, like, of course, has yeah, to be Dave McGowan. Sting. Yeah. Well, Sting to, to Sting to his credit hasn't gone as bad as uh, say Bono. Yeah. Right. Well. well yeah. Of course. Annie, right. Annie Lennox or people like yeah. that. You know, I, you know, again, I remember when that album came out, that Synchronicity album, and and you know, I didn't know what Young was. Well, I kind of had heard of him, but I didn't really understand. And here's a guy, a, a, sing, a single in the charts, a hit record that talks about the relationship between Alistair Crowley and the Loch Ness Monster, the the archetypes, that all being then compared to a guy going to work in England, his wife going nuts, the the, the society Mm -hmm. collapsing. And it was like, in in a great song, in a great song. No, in a powerful song. And, uh, but I I have a lot of time for Sting because, yeah, I mean, you know, he is obviously mainstream and everything, but... I think you can still manage to tone it down. And he's toned it down compared to a compared to a lot of them, like say Bono and Bon John Bon Jovi or Annie Lennox. Yeah. He never he, he doesn't do the soapbox soapbox really. I have, a, I have a lot of time for Sting actually. That's rad. I mean, and that gives like I think it's good because he's like, uh, well, he's hard for me to kind of frame up because I'm right in that end of Gen X thing where it's just like I I appreciate the police obviously, right? But then getting into, and I get it, you know, that's where pop was at, you know, yeah. late 80s, early 90s type stuff. So I, I get it. Um, and, I, you know, you would know, you know, you're you're over there as opposed to, you know, takes vary. It's, it's weird. They're more nuanced. Um, well, to me, the Generation X thing with the American punk rock thing. Uh, punk rock in America did, did not really go mainstream. It was still a fringe thing when it happened. Where in this part of the world, it was it was. It we was talking seventy seven, like Stooges yeah. era. Oh right, yeah, they were playing "Damned" on the radio, right? Oh, I mean, Buzzcocks, "Damned." Every they were they were in the charts. Oh, Buzzcocks, so much. Like, how come we didn't, didn't have? Susie and the Banshees. This was all mainstream bands. They were not fringe at all. This was our music scene for yeah. most young people, and uh, so that didn't happen in America. You were still listening to Fleetwood Mac and Peter Frampton and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Your generation X was when. Uh, your punk rock was in Nirvana, and you yeah, know we had that, yeah. that, that was real. Sonic and bands like Sonic Youth started to get a lot of oh, success. Yeah. That's when it happened for you guys. The Melvins, uh, the music scene, and the music scene in America, America basically oppressed the music industry, oppressed mm-hmm. that punk rock thing. I can remember there was interviews of people from Splitwood Mac were saying things like, "If if anybody signs the Sex Pistols, we're leaving this record label." This is the kind of crap that was going on at the time. You know, and they had the, the and, and the American music industry was so colossal and bringing in so much money at the time of punk that they had they had that power. Punk. They had that power, and uh, but it, you're, you got your punk music revolution twenty years later, or, or 10, 15 years later with with the Generation X 
hitting the Nirvana and all that stuff. Soundgarden, all those. Yeah, yeah. And Ronald's, and it, it became really, there was a kind of a good energy, here, you know, a lot of different kinds of bands that were somewhere from early, like Danzig or from an earlier period, but they all kind oh, of well. gelled nicely for the right generation at that time. And, uh, but we'd already gone through that um, in this part of the world. We'd already passed through that. And, you know, it, it'd gone more towards electronic music and stuff like that in, in Europe and UK and Ireland. And, uh, but I, I, when I was going on, I knew exactly how, what was going. Even the way, you know, Kurt Cobain died, that was like the Sid Vicious moment, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And even the, the Sid and Nancy thing was even echoed by him and his wife, Courtney. That was oh, just dude, something. and then the mind control ship with her. Yeah. Oh, and then all the conspiracies that poured out of that and everything, but um, I, I, you see, I think I think now or now these days the two societies, Europe and America, are very very similar. The internet has done a lot to kind of bring us all very similar now. We're more or less on the same wavelength, uh, and that includes the alternative scene. Yeah. The alternative mm -hmm. scene are basically all agreeing with each other in Europe and in America. Canada and so on, Australia. We're all it's pretty uniform. All, they would have never been able to. They would have never been able to bring the world together under this coronavirus thing if it wasn't for the internet, because that really did it. But the alternative scene wouldn't have been able to get the kind of stand against it if it wasn't for the internet. Absolutely, and it's yeah, it's been galvanizing. It's been beautiful because it, yeah, it really. We've all been brought to a sort of certain level, regardless of age or anything like that. Right. The, something about now that we, this is this is, we're kind of like the punks of the internet. In fact, the, mm -hmm. is, the last punks that are left are the alternative scene, that are, the alternative, you know, internet scene. Us, us, we're, we're the last of the punks. It's weird. I mean, Jim's well, freedom of been thought. in for a long time. Jim's been in it for a while. And, and we're not trying to, and we don't, we're, no, yeah. The, 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 the anarchist nature of the punks was not to impose your thing on someone else. Right. We, we don't tell people, you better believe what we believe. We just do it. Yeah. Where the mainstream goes, you better believe what we believe. In. And it's something that we can't hold, too. You know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things. Like, the youth invariably hold this. You know what I mean? Like, make sure you take care of this because we pass it on. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, well, at least the same sort of sentiments, if you will, in the DIY mentality like that's that's ultimately where it lies for me i feel like that's the punk rock yeah well uh thomas uh we talk about this a lot on this show but um that whole diy thing that's that's where the freedom is like getting and that's what makes us us dangerous like all of us mm -hmm. in this this community is the free thinkers are the ones that are dangerous to the system. And the tighter the system is, the more we've got to break out of it. And you're not going to do it. You're, <coughs> nobody's going to show you this. You have to figure it out yourself. And that's what I think Punk told me, taught me Absolutely. well. Like, uh, I remember, um, I think it was like 88 or 89, all had this album and they had this song called uh, Educated Idiot. Yeah. And the first, one of the first lines was, um, um, oh, shoot, sorry, I just lost it. But it was, it was freedom of thought. And, you know, I, I know nothing, essentially, or, or academia knows jack shit about reality. And the funny thing is, is that's like, uh, they were members of academia. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like super smart descendants. You know what I mean? Like those cats. Yeah, Milo's a Milo was a, a uh, yeah has his doctorate. He's a he used to work for Dupont as a scientist, as Biotech. a biological scientist. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, what you're saying there about the we are the danger. We're the danger, but we're still small, and so they tolerate us to a degree. When we were start, I'll give you two examples of when they didn't tolerate us. <clears throat> if you were to look at, if you were to look at YouTube before Google took it over, it was nearly all Alex Jones. Alex Jones and David Icke completely controlled YouTube. These videos were getting, and videos like them were getting phenomenal views, half a million views, seven hundred fifty, where like everyone else was getting like ten thousand. Even pop videos were getting like five, six thousand. Madonna video. 
And it was like the alternative, because we're DIY, like you said, they had suddenly seized upon YouTube. This is uncharted territory. This is an untapped resource, like fanzines, like where in the old days, or public yeah. access television was in the old days. Oh, the and 10 years ago, YouTube was basically, a, 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 it, was, it was pure anarchy. Yeah. It was yeah. people like us had ran the thing. And it was, that's really all that was on it. And then Google took it over. And now it's, you know, mm-hmm. they, who they decide is going to, it's, all, it's, it's mainstream TV basically at this point. And you have, if you have, you yeah. know, if, if you're, I feel sorry for anyone starting on YouTube now in the alternative, because the the, the stable door is locked and the, the horse is the boat the horse is bolted. The only reason, like, I have an audience is because I got there just before Google took over and that kind of thing, you know. But otherwise, they've censored everyone else out and put them onto like you have to go to BitChute or somewhere like that. But that was an example. The other one is the the, the stringent uh, censorship on Facebook. Facebook. Mm-hmm is frighteningly censorship now i just got another 30 day ban for joking that canadian women were better looking than irish women i just did as <laughs> I, and I, I was done for hate speech but i've been done for hate speech by saying things like oh i can't stand this country is driving me crazy the you know the irish drive me nuts you know i mean my own people and i've been done for hate speech against myself the 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 idiots who monitor monitor Facebook are there for a reason. They don't understand satire, humor, and jokes. They don't understand those subtle nuances between, <clears throat> you know, what's hate and what's what's a dig or a rib, a laugh, what's a laugh, a bit of fun. Yeah. Well, having this is what we get for things. having an algorithm run society, like yeah. run societal interaction. You have an an artificial intelligence. I mean, yeah, and then we debate artificial consciousness or whatever. But you have something artificial telling us what to think. You know, yeah, there's no we're fucking for, ourselves. There's no room for humor in our autistic future. It, 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 yeah, and also the people they hire for these community standards people, they're running on the same consciousness program as the AI. They don't. They they're they're not even human anymore. They they run according to what they they there there's no their neurology and the, what's on the some cube, so computer supercomputer is the same thing, their cognition is no more uh, developed in terms of understanding satire and humor and, and and taking the piss, you know it's black and white thinking and that's and that's because that, that's who they hire these kinds of people, and I th- I, I and this what you said there Jim the autism thing I'm not putting that up. But there seems to be an idealism within the mainstream to have people who who are, have an autistic mindset. Have you noticed that? Can whether you... they're reporters on the media, whether they're TV presenters, even with their bands. I mean, some of the bands I see today, I'm like, you know, where did you learn how to play that? You know, on you know, on Netch Sketch or something. Elon you know, it's Musk, like, man. I'm yeah. so, after seeing that SNL, I was like, what? And then he mm-hmm. opened with the. Oh, feel sorry for me because I'm a billionaire with Asperger's. Right away, he played that. I was like, "Gross, man!" And then, you know, I I hadn't heard until just like maybe two a week ago, two weeks ago, where Wayne McCroy posits that autistic children are devoid of soul. Um, I know a lot of people that's like have heard that, you know rambling around it seems pretty damn controversial to go that far but i mean there's there's some solid framework there i think uh, as well, the thought exercise at least well, it's, you, know, there's that, you know i know some hindu people <clears throat> having been interested in that scene and there's a there's a theory among many swamis not even some and sadhus that there are more bodies on this earth at the moment than there are souls, souls. in the circulation. I knew it. And I can tell you, I, I really do believe that now. Okay. And this explains the proliferation of the NPC. The proliferation of the NPC is a husk. It has the, you know, if you say that, like, when you say a soul, what do you, you're talking about the psyche, the subconscious, the, 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 the observer behind the self, right? It seems to me that these NPCs are just the self. There's nothing 
and behind that, okay? Now, behind that is what we would call the soul, okay? Now, in Hinduism, increasingly, it's although it's considered controversial there too, there's too many people, it's always been belief in Hinduism that there's only so many souls can be accommodated on this planet at certain times. And if they're not, what happens is people are born that don't have a soul. They're just like the NPCs, they just function. They don't think deeply about anything. They don't, they don't concept, they can't, they don't have an inner monologue, which is a very important one. Or contemplation, and the ability for even just contemplation. To follow protocol. Uh, and this is why Hindus have never been against abortion. Well, that and also uh, reincarnation. They believe in reincarnation. They just come back anyway. And so that's why they've never had the same kind of issues Take. with abortion. Right. Have. And um, so their belief is there's too many people and not enough souls. And I tell you something, I'm kind of down with that now. I kind of agree with that. I don't have a problem with that. For sure. Now, that, that may be an awful thing for a Christian to hear, and I'm not insulting people who are Christians. I don't care if you're insulted, but I'm not, I'm not doing right. it to hurt you. Amen. I just don't care. Own it. Own it. But, uh, but, like, that's, you know, people from the, the Christian background, that's a, a horrific thing to hear because it's totally against what they've been brought up with. But, you know, there's more than one with the spiritual philosophy on this earth than, you know, Christianity. And uh, I think if we were to go back post- Christianization, post Constantine, Roman Empire, mm. or ancient Greece, or pagan Europe, they would have said the same thing. There's the difference between someone with a soul and someone who hasn't. And uh, I think that's one of the things maybe Christianity exploded in popularity because you were able to take all these soulless types and say, "Yeah, hey, you oh, matter that's now." That's crazy. That's fun. matter now. And and it's been that even mainstream people have compared this change in society now is very similar to what happened when the the pagan world fell in Europe, the classical pagan world fell in Europe and was replaced by the, the, the Christian world. A lot of the same things happened. Uh, it just, you know, if you, look at, if you look at classical pagan art prior to, say, the Edict of Milan, when, when Christianity was made the state, official state religion, it's incredible. They were artistic paintings. It was, it was Renaissance-level painting they were doing 2,000 years ago. When Christianity took over, there was almost like a great reset. And you had the, the artwork is like stick figures. It was like the next generation could, couldn't draw anything. They couldn't, they didn't, this perspective had been completely lost and wasn't rediscovered until the Renaissance. Things like architecture, like in Catherine Nixie's book, they said the only reason they didn't destroy the statues of the pagan gods at the Parthenon is because they didn't know how to make scaffolding anymore. They didn't understand how to make engineering had died with the with the with the growth of the, the new religion. It was, literally was a reset, uh, and the old skills were lost. And it was only it wasn't until like what fifteen hundred years later that when they were rebuilding Rome and Florence, they found all these incredible statues that were that were built by classical sculptors to you know two thousand years previously. That they, they they started to bring that that's when we got the, the italian renaissance and stuff because they discovered that they'd rediscovered what had been lost but it's the same today i think it's the same today i think you know <clears throat> what you have people who seem to like you know when you see little kids talk about like white nationalism is the biggest problem on the earth no no no, no. poverty and starvation sweetie is the biggest really? problem on the Opre and there's hard there's many many more problems on the earth rather than that or toxic masculinity. No, no, no. There's children in Africa and children in parts of Asia who are dying because they can't get water. That's a bigger problem, sweetheart. But I you promise. can't get you can't get through to them. Yeah. Jim. You know, and, and, and when I say kids, I'm talking about like college, you know, people who are doing graduate degrees at 24, 25. The biggest problem in the world today is toxic masculinity. No, it's not. It's or climate it's, change. It's poverty. Climate change. It's poverty. You know, there's still the poor, there's still very, very poor people in the third world. What about them? No, it's my, my, prof my, my, my sociology professor says white nationalism is the real problem. That's what the real problem is. And you're like, will you fucking think, please? Will you actually use your fucking brain? But they can't. They can't. It's the same thing has happened again. I love that you bring up the point where you call it knee jerk. Like it's almost like a knee jerk reaction, but anything that has that, that knee jerk reaction, I like. I think well, the slow. There's loads of memes about it, isn't there? Like when the they show the yeah. it goes to a rage, it goes into rage. 
It's mm-hmm. like when you, when you say something that's obviously common sense, they go, ah, they start <laughs> screaming and banging. They're like art- artistics. I hate to say I'm, I, I'm not putting down artistic no. people. Please think that. But don't they behave in the, when an artistic person can get, some artistic people, when they get confused, can start like banging their heads. Well, you see like so many of these SJW uh, events and someone comes up to them and says, yeah, but surely you can't defund the police because, you know, who's going to protect your elder grandmother from burglars? And they start going, yeah, you white day. I mean, that, they, they behave the same way. And these are people who are doing advanced degrees in college and that's how they're behaving. It's like you're missing the point. It's demilitarized the police and you had a chance and you ran with the wrong, the wrong code, man, to put on that billboard. And now oh. it's a meme. It's like demilitarize. That's, that's what we really need, but whatever. It's Thomas. Are you, are you aware of, um, of Howdy McCuskey? No, I was about to say, I was about to bring him up. He's in, so, is he in Denmark. No. Yeah, I'm not sure where he I'm is. Terrible but at names. I might have come across their work, though. But he's how- done this stuff on the uh, World's Fairs and all the all the whole cities and stuff that we've lost since the the World's Fairs were going on, and uh, basically since the Great Depression and then World War II, that trauma kind of erased so, so much right before all of that we lost like there is a collective amnesia that he's kind of documented like you can see it the united states had some of the most beautiful architecture in the world and it was destroyed by urban planners and mm-hmm. robert Moses, look, robert mo in fact and, and it not only destroyed the architecture it destroyed societies robert moses was this kind of like mac daddy of american planning and he he used mold highways, brand new highway projects, and a classic one is the Cross Bronx Expressway. And I, I, I had a friend who used to study these things in New York, and he told me about it, that the, the Bronx was like the nicest part of New York to live in. Uh, and, uh, must be, and he showed me photographs of what the Bronx looked like mm-hmm. in the 20s, and 30s, and 40s. It, was, it looked like Paris. It looked like Paris. And then Robert Moses built the Cross Bronx Expressway right across the Bronx to connect New England with uh, New Jersey. It went over to what George Washington Bridge. So basically the South Bronx had been sliced away from the rest of New York. Within 10 years, this was a hellhole. The road actually acted as a, a, a psychic barrier to people. Like don't broke go, down. Oh, don't go on the other side of the Cross Bronx Expressway. You know, like the expression in America, the other side of the tracks. Well, that's a real thing. That's a very real thing. Real liminal space. And, and in Ireland, they have like these peace walls where like, you know, in, in Northern Ireland, you'll have places where a Catholic doesn't go there or a Protestant doesn't go there. No, there's no trouble, but it's like in their own minds. Oh, I'll go to the end of that street. It's only Catholics live up there. You know, and that's the same thing. And the same thing happened with... So what happened was when the Bronx deteriorated they said let's build housing projects to try and fix it somehow because all the old buildings the beautiful old brownstones were falling apart because of slum lords and stuff like that and so they demolished literally tens of thousands of beautiful buildings and that's happened all over the usa and it happened in other places as well in birmingham and england is another one at a beautiful city center that the, the, the nazis couldn't even bomb it and then they ended up the urban planners in the 60s destroyed it with roads and shopping centers. And this is the brutalist, the brutalist, brutalism it's called. And it was invented by French communists. And it was a way of French communists to say, how do we destroy urban communities? We build high rise tower blocks. Cheap. We make them so they can't be policed. Everyone's isolated and they're all trapped by roads, big, big roads. And that's what a lot of that is about, about that there was a, a war on working class people, mostly, that took place in the 20th century that was initially designed by French communists in the brutalism movement. And it was a way, you, you, you see a lot of problems we have today, a lot of it goes back to French communists. The French pseudo-intellectual communist uh, movement in terms of like the legalization of pedophilia, this has all been talked about in the cafe societies in, in France in the 50s and 60s after World War II. And a lot of that stuff has now in paint like Sartre and stuff like that. That I mean, you had situ- you had a situation in the in the late 60s 
where French intellectuals said that the, the sexual age should be reduced, comp abolished completely, that adults and children could have sex anyway because it's freedom. And they knew they did this knowing it would destroy the family. And a lot of these people are also involved in urban planning and things like brutalism. And that those things came through the new school in New York. That was a very, there was a breeding ground for cultural Marxists and communism. Yeah. And they were the ones in that, Robert Moses and all these types, all were all involved in that. The wholesale destruction of old American cities, old American cities in order to use that great word today, uh, reimagine reset everything you know and this is how they've always maintained control these same families these same power structures these same schools these same euphemisms fraternities and freemasons they uh, destroy what exists when it gets to a stable point position and then they rebuild it again and that allows them to maintain control in fact that's even a central tenant of scottish right freemasonry is to to gather up that which has been scattered on purpose almost in the uh in the uh in the same vein as uh what like osiris the whole yeah put the thing together yeah 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 but then but in their benefit for their benefit oh absolutely and yeah. it's like and the brut brutalist bricks right yeah it's happening on a global scale here now with this whole lockdown the pandemic and all this nonsense and the klaus schwab and his great reset it's the same thing Scatter up that which has been scattered. Have you talked to Charlie Robinson yet? That? Have you talked to Charlie Robinson yet? Uh, do you... I, 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 let me tell you, I'm completely out of this. I don't want to. It's all. It's, no, it's cool. What's going on in this scene? He's um, just, I, you know. He comes from like an economic standpoint and brings a lot of uh, ba his background into yeah. this. It's like confessions of an economic hitman tipped him off in like 2008, and then he just went on a rampage. It's pretty good. Well, well, I. I, I, I went on tour with John Perkins when that uh, when my first book came there out. You go. There was a we had a tour called the Economic Hitman Tour, and it was me, him, Max Kaiser from Russia Today. Oh, Max Kaiser. And I was on the bottom of the bill, and um, I, I spent a lot of time with John Perkins talking to him, and a very interesting, a very interesting guy. And uh, so I was well aware of all that stuff. Yeah, and and like the deliberate the, what the IMF are doing with countries. They do it on a social level as well. They don't only do it with money. They do it with your your sense of self. You know, when your old people say, when I was a kid, it was all farms around here. Well, they deliberately create urban sprawl for that reason, to destroy the countryside, to destroy the small towns, to destroy any kind of culture that's organically established or on the cusp of being organically established. They'll ask for they a it then. I mean, what it passed the African Americans said uh, they were coming up very well in the world after World War II. Things were going very, you know, very nicely for African Americans in the 50s, 40s, 50s. Wealth was growing, things were happening. And then suddenly you have this civil rights movement. You know, there was injustices in the South and all that. We do know that. Right. But I mean, it wasn't, it, it, why did cities like Philadelphia and Newark, New Jersey, born to the ground when there were, those problems didn't exist there. The funny it thing a, is, it Thomas, was a great reset. It was a great reset for the African American community. Right, and throughout history, when you go through all these cities, and Howdy Mikoski brings this up in one of his books, the exposing the expositions. He's been uh, he's the expert on like Egypt and taking not, not your, how can I put it? He's a he's got a refreshing take on Egypt. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and he was a Canadian hockey coach before. So he's been through, you know, the societal norms, this and the other. And basically what he discovers when he digs into these, these great expositions is they all have like really, really, uh, sketchy fire that breaks out a couple of years before, a couple of years after. Um, and I, I mean, we're talking like Buffalo, San Francisco, really thinking now about the 66 world fair in new york uh, it really got me thinking about that now, that, he, get this. That, was, that was on the cusp of when american cities started burning down with the exactly racial now what's wild and also about the other one is that in new york had a massive blackout after that have huge problems that never had problem with blackouts and, that, and then new york itself as a city died after that yeah. they had the world fair in new york in 66 and then New York City basically died until the 1980s, late 1980s. Funny. So 
let's Very, roll, roll it back yeah. to like the 18 late 1800s early 1900s okay when they were rolling through all these towns with a huge midway right well what he discovers is super suspect proofs of them building actually building what they say they're building okay now he posits that maybe the buildings okay there's no there's no way in hell that the workload that they said they had 40,000 guys or 20,000 guys worked round the clock for two years to bring these structures that they're claiming they are with the photographic evidence of like we're talking Roman shit you know what I mean like crazy yeah, I've seen some of the photographs of like the the St. Louis World Fair or whatever right uh, they, they only happen really in America and France they didn't happen really anywhere and there's another one the, the Crystal Palace in London that was a World Fair and that bore to the ground right after as well there's a Crystal Palace in every single one of these fairs that's so another are we, funny thing are we dealing with some kind of ritual mass like a pop up Right, there's like a, a pop-up yeah, kind of situation. Yeah, yeah there's the part of London is still called Crystal Palace. The soccer famous that plays there still call themselves Crystal Palace after the Christmas Palace that was there. After it was right. Yep. Yeah. So it's like, are the, the, are these rituals these world fairs? Are they are they, are they like great grand resetters, mass? kind of for marking time? Possibly that's one thing he throws out there. It's what would be the one for this one? Olympic opening ceremonies. There you go. The London twenty twelve even fly stuff on that he totally years ago he called that one correct and he did it only got more profound i had just showed that last night at like 11 midnight with a buddy who's in town from san francisco like a childhood close ex-bandmate type friend you know lifelong and he's not into any of he's, he's you know he's doing his thing and i show him that little thing from 2012 he's like what the fuck is even he these just, guys are the he, greatest the greatest mind readers of all time but are actually planning some right but now you've got send me when this is over send me that gentleman that doesn't talk about the world fairs oh, yeah. honest, that's because you're right every world fair seems to be accompanied by a horrible disaster thomas i read that book literally in like five hours it was a one of the fastest reads i've and most captivating one sitting that was a wrap i just blazed through it like yeah, i need more you know, but it's just the thought exercises. Obviously, it's coming coming up right now, and talking about it brings it back up, and we can maybe put some pieces together, hopefully, you know, or ask better questions, right? Well, that's 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 a very interesting line of speculation, I must say. It's fascinating, and he's in Denmark, I believe, too. So he's, he's I think he's lined up. I'll have, I'll have to check him out. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely send you a link and stuff. Um. So I don't know if you want to, I mean, I can chop this part out, but I don't know how long you want to go. Just yeah, I can say for a little bit longer. I okay. don't, you have to ask me questions because I won't come I will, you no. know. No, I get it. Okay. So let's see. So I, yeah, I have a, a question going back to, um, we we're talking about separation of soul and humans being born without souls. Do you believe that you can reclaim your soul? I've only ever heard that in New Age circles, that you, you have this thing called soul loss. And Carl Jung spoke in indigenous societies about that there were individuals who suffered from soul loss. And they had, there were rituals among Native American tribes and also African, West African tribes where you could like reclaim restore your soul now i don't know what that involves but it always seems to involve shamanism uh, in both africa and north america and also in in siberia where you do have sham you you hear a lot about shamanism constantly but it, the shamanism is not very common in the world it's only in certain places that it takes you know in europe the only place they ever really had shamanism proper was in hungary and that probably came with the huns from the east but otherwise, it's just their own. That's what the whole thing was that there was a method to get the soul back. Now, did the, a, a dead soul, the soul of someone else go into them, or was there no? I don't know. But it, I mean, the only place I've ever heard with soul loss is a new age kind of thing, where they say people, "I've lost my soul." What, why have you lost? Soul? I'm suffering from depression. No, you're suffering from depression. You haven't lost your soul. You know be. this kind of thing. You know, 
they, they, you know, and uh, but that's interesting. There used to be a kind of a shamanistic group in Ireland called fairy doctors. And they were quite common here. And what they used to deal with, this is, uh, you want to hear this for a conspiracy. Uh, they used to go around the country helping people who suffered from trauma or depression. And after the fact, and, and, and what they used to do was they would dance with them all night long, make them dance for 24, hour, for 24 hours and do these rituals. And, this, and they would cure them of extreme depression, what they called melancholia back then, you know, this kind of thing. And after the famine in Ireland uh, in the 1840s, the country was devastated. Lots of millions had emigrated, millions had died. And the ones that were left over were kind of like young men were suffering tremendously from depression, uh, what they called the melancholies back then. And these fairy doctors used to go around and help them. It was tremendous success. And they would, you know, bring them, they would dance, the, the, theory, this, this, the, the legend was, the story was, they would dance them into fairyland. They would dance them into fairyland and, and then when they came to the side, they were cured of the depression and they could get on with their lives and be productive members of society again. And, you know, this kind of thing. And that all stopped with a massive building program in the 1850s and 60s of gigantic mental hospitals in Ireland. And these hospitals are like, they look like something of a fucking horror film. They are like gothic stone structures you expect Dracula to come out of or something out of like that. The expositions, right? Yeah. To help pe- oh, these things are not to help yeah. people deal with their, you know, you're mentally in, you're going to bring it to somewhere it looks like Dracula's castle. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And they would do, you know, horrible things and he's going to chain them up and stuff like that. But as these places were being built, they started to ban the fairy doctors, making laws against them. So you can see again a reset. Yep. Someone was saying these these guys are having success in the towns and villages, curing people who have mental illness. No, the state has to take control, and the state started building massive mental hospitals. You know, it, again, destroy anything that's organically good yep. and take it over. It, yeah, that hijacking. Well, that and who are they? Who are they sending out now as? first responders but psychologists oh yeah well, psychiatrists especially to talk you know the the uh, the uh, uh, di- diagnostic statistic manual is like their uh their their bible you know mm-hmm. toxic how you, you know, oh you know i had a bad day today why oh i missed the train i had to get a later train yo you've been diagnosed with you're suffering from Genius here's your oh, all that crap going on you know mm-hmm it's wild. So, uh, talking dreams, you were lately, uh, and them ramping up coinciding with the CME. Oh, the CME that's hitting us right now. Very interesting to mention that. So, I found it pretty crazy that you mentioned it. And then I keep a dream journal, and it's literally like I got so sick of writing, I chose not to remember my dreams. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's one of point in my life but over the last week week and a half i've had burst session kind of dreams to where i'm like trying to write stuff down and it's just like uh where is it it's like they rapidly flood the mind like leaving me with tons of empty ended journal entries that feel like they're attempts not solid entries just attempts do you know what i'm saying it, it they don't feel fragmented, but they feel like there's I feel like there's something there, but I'm scratching kind of at. It's it's like, really weird. Like jigsaw pieces that you yeah. have. Yeah, you have the jigsaw puzzle, but you you don't have they haven't assembled the pieces. Oh, the picture. That's, that's how it happens. Your subconscious mind works that way. It kind of like finds a bit and then throws it at you, and then you wait for the next bit. Maybe down the road they'll all start gluing together. Uh, there's very interesting about the CME thing. We're actually being battled with it right now. And uh, uh, the, this, the, the Northern Hemisphere has been acting very strange for the last month or so. There's been a weird cold front that's been coming down from the North with this weird kind of electromagnetic activity above the North Pole, which they can't really figure out. And uh, the CMA, the CMA, CME, coronal mass ejection, kicked off three days ago and it hit yesterday, a sideways glance at the Earth. Uh, it didn't hit us full on. But everyone on my social media is saying they're having a sense of feeling edgy, 
they're having really intense or bad dreams. There's a, a you know, there's something not right. Got it is and we, we we get hit by CMEs a fair amount, but this one was a big one. And this seems to be affecting people very badly, or not very badly, but putting them off kilter, you know, and a sense of tension that, that you, I haven't felt to be honest with you, uh, a huge sense of tension, maybe because I was ready for it. That could be the reason why I was actually ready for it. But uh, the CMA, the, this, this, the CME thing is so interesting because it compresses, it affects things like the magnetosphere. And, the, you know, your brain is very affected by magnetism and things like that. And um, it, so it's, you know, it's, 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 it's that Renfielding thing. The ones who are crazy act a bit crazy beforehand. Now, what's happening? The last few days have been very strange. I see Fauci getting attacked. Pariah. He's a- in the media. I see people now saying maybe it was the Wuhan thing after all, and Trump and the, and the people who said it was a leak. And here in Ireland, the guy, this guy called Hulahan, dickhead, who's like our, our COVID czar, our COVID czar, who's like, he's been riding on a crestable wave of the great hero saving us from this disease, is now being trashed in the media as someone who went too far. And it's like, as you said the other day, a switch went off. And as soon as the, the CME hit, it was like the normies who were on the started to get an, a, an ounce of cogent, independent thinking, and they started using it. And I, I couldn't believe it yesterday when The Guardian in England, the, the most left-wing, liberal, sickening, woke rag on the planet, were saying, it looks like it was a leak from Wuhan and the whole liberal world will come crashing down because, <laughs> Trump, was right, because Trump was right. And I was reading it's this in my like, oh, Where did this all come from? And I was starting to think, it's the fucking CME. It's almost like... Uh, it, it, it's Throws almost like this clarity, this clarity from every so often the sun goes, fuck you, bump, and, and, and sends it up, sends a blast at the earth. And rightfully so, because we yeah. need Plus, it. I think Mercury's in Gatorade right now. Uh-oh. Oh, really? Yeah. And there's, uh, yeah, it always seems to be, though. Everyone knows that's like, <laughs> it's, it's when is it not? When is it not? Again? <laughs> you know, when is it, when is it not? Yeah, it's become a sick joke, like a cosmic tragedy, almost. But, uh, yeah, right. the the thing about uh, let's see, the charisma <laughs> thing I want to touch on too, which I think is super important. Like you mentioned, charisma and a lack oh, yeah. of it. Well, that's like the NPC; they don't have it, do yeah. they? Always don't have it. Uh, charisma is well. This is where we're going into deep territory here. People have uh, people people have a charismatic personality and attracted to them. And I'm talking genuinely. I'm not talking about you know someone who's a, a, a used car salesman type. <laughs> right. Or a TV preacher. I'm talking about, about, the, real, about the real thing. Like so many, you, 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 you're standing in a train, you get on a train one day, and there's a guy sitting across you, or a woman who needs to have a conversation with you, and you're like, wow, what an interesting person. I could talk to them all day. And it's something they just make it feel that that's that, that that that's following their dharma. It being true to yourself, and and, and this was a great thing about the. A great a great thing about the what's happened in the last year and a half with the whole Rona thing is that people who haven't been following their dharma are in terms of this saying they know it's things they know this whole lockdown COVID thing there's something not right but they're playing along they're playing along they're the most they're the most miserable people you meet right now yeah. because they're fighting against the truth inside them where fellas like us and people like us who went this thing is a lot of bullshit there's something not right here we're all like having a great time we're all relaxed and happy you know, and and he's, and it's like I think this is this this is like this. You see it, and all the people I know who think it's a lot of bullshit are all like doing really well. They're really in a good, positive mood. All the ones who are fighting it are all depressed, and that's because the, the ones who are it, it, it's your nervous system. When you're true to how you're in, your okay, it begins your intuition. This is real or it's bullshit, right? If it's bullshit and you pretend it isn't your nervous system collapses in on itself to maintain this lie, right? Therefore, your charismatic charge, which is your nervous system, boom, booming out, right, is increased and it's gone inside, right? But if something is a, is bullshit and you say to yourself, you know what, it's fucking bullshit. 
the psychic energy that uh, that you needed to maintain that lie to yourself allows your charismatic charge your nervous system to expand greatly and people are like oh he's he's okay she's okay you know they they, they, because they don't have this tension in them you know charisma is almost like the lack of tension you know the greek word it means the the grace of the gods it and you know and there are people who have tremendous confidence who are you say to them, yeah, he's right. She's right to feel that way. And then there's people who have tremendous confidence who have hubris or are cocky. And you know they're full of shit. You know that kind of thing? Like that kind of like gangster rapping Absolutely. thing. You know it's all bullshit. You know, they don't really feel that way. But, you know, you meet people who have a genuine... Posers. Yeah. Years and years ago, I met John McEnroe, the tennis player, through his brother, who I became kind of friends with. Uh, and they were, he was Tim and the fact they were visiting their relatives in Ireland. And I briefly met John Rack, John McEnroe when he was like Wimbledon three times champion and this kind of thing. And he came, you know, you know, you, you know, pits of the air, man, you like make fun of him, throwing a, a, a tantrums and all. They hated him. But when I laid eyes upon John McEnroe, I beheld a god. He's uh, got he that. Had, He's got that. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Because he knew he was the best tennis player in the world because he was an asshole. He owned it. Because he had worked it and made himself that way. And with and, and the, the whole image of him being an asshole, uh, portrayed in the media, losing his temper, he wasn't like that at all. He was asking what kind of bands I was into, what kind of music I was into, and we were talking about the clash and stuff like that. And it was like, I just, I, and when it was over, I was like, I just had a conversation with John McEnroe. He's like one of the coolest people I've ever met in my life. And that's because of his charisma, because he didn't give a shit what the media said about him. He didn't give a shit what umpires and, you know, anything. He just followed his dharma as the greatest tennis player he could be. Dare and that, I. that was a great lesson to me as an, at an early age. And I know other people have, have met select Hollywood stars, like certain types, and they say, you just can't, you just, you just immediately like them because they're not fakes. They're not, they're the real thing. And I think that's what it is. I think when you're true to yourself and follow your dharma, your charismatic charge glows. Right. Even if it pisses off others that don't want that. Like if it's if in his case, it was like he pissed off the sort of the snobbery around tennis, you know, that kind of thing. It was like it was like a rich man's game when he well, especially in this part of the world. It's like the country rich, club. It's the same kind club. of same thing. He was from a working class family in Long Island, you know, so he kind of blew that open and he, he didn't he maintained that mentality all through his life. And that's why he had that. He had that. He had that. Yeah. And that's what the charisma is. Be, you follow your dharma, be true to yourself. And, you know, we all lie to ourselves to a certain extent to avoid things, but it will never serve you well. It'll never serve you well because eventually you will use up all your psychic energy to keep that the suppression of that feeling inside you. Right. Yeah. You psychosomatic- know, I really, I really appreciate that that stuff that you've been doing about the charisma stuff, because it's about finding yourself and being living authentically, you know? So, so important, you know, so important, you know, and uh, I can't, I can't stress enough to people that, you know, just be yourself and, you know, you know, don't, you know, of course, if you're an asshole, don't be an asshole around the wrong, like, don't use bad language around children and stuff like, I, mean, I don't mean that way. I mean, maintain decorum and respect be respectful mm-hmm. but in terms of like your limitations it's very this is a thing like it's very important it's important to know your limitations as it is your potentials it's very important like you, you know you, I, I know i'll never win the olymp an olympic sprint medal that's okay i sell the way i got rid of that you know got rid of that. i don't have you know and that's why a lot of these people another one that's negative charisma are people who didn't achieve what they wanted to in life and harper onto it like, oh, my band could have been the biggest band in the world. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, when I was playing soccer in school, I could have been a professional playing for Barcelona. Now, you'll find that those people and the ones who kind of relive their childhood, like glory days kind of thing, they're often very much in, in have low charisma because they're, they're, they've put all their psychic energy into something that has failed rather than saying, it didn't work out, move on. And the same relationships, like these guys who... They, their marriage broke up and they're still upset about their wives 20 years later. Well, you're not going to find another woman if you're still upset about her. Move on, move on. 
but just move on, forget about it, you know. And so you get, you get that's that's the, the charismatic thing. It's something I really should. I want to make a proper video on it, a proper, an hour long video on it. I'd like to do that. But what I would like to do is interview people I know to have it, like famous people. I know a few actually. I know it's, it's, I'm not going to name them, but they have that glow about them, and I'd like to. I'd, I'd like to make a video about that because this, I think there's a great gift for people in knowing how that stuff works. Well, I think a lot of that too is, is like what you're talking about is accepting of your victimhood. Like these people accept that they are victims and it's so easy after that. Like once, once you like, oh, well, they they oppressed me and then, that, you know, yeah. I'm a victim of this and, and, and then, or you're, I'm so brave because I'm a, yeah, whatever. It's easy to kick that can way down the road really quickly. Cause you're not, do, you're not, you're yeah. not examining your own hypocrisies and yeah. you're buying into your own bullshit. Yeah. I mean, no, like just, uh, it, I mean, we're back to the kind of BDS, BDSM thing we started at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares. Anybody is gay today. Not me. I'm gay. Okay. Good. That's your own business. Yeah. No, but those the days of when that was a taboo are long gone, right? The gay people are now mainstream in society, but for some younger gay people, that's not good enough. They want to feel like they're being oppressed by homophobes, and everyone's a homophobe. Have you met the ever as opposed to the gays who actually had to come through the hard way through the really bad right. days of like queer bashers outside bars beating them up and stuff like that Dude. back in the fifties, the sixties, the seventies? They were the ones who went through the shit. You know, and you find that many of them, as old guys today, are very relaxed and easy going. Yep. They're not they're not bitter about having being, you know, they, they remember it, they didn't enjoy it, but they're 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 happy with the with the the, the civil rights thing has brought to the point where gay people aren't beaten up when they're walking down the street or anything like that anymore. Right, but if anything, the ones, they're more advantage. The ones who have it easy today are like, uh, we're missing out on being oppressed, so let's invent oppression. And there's a lot of that goes on. Everyone, a lot of middle class people today in suburbia all have this. They're all victims. I mean, all that they're all victims of something or other. Mm -hmm. and that, that, that's that's a way to slaughter your karma. That's a way to absolutely slaughter your karma. It's like chopping it off yeah. at the root. Yep. You know what's what's my victim status today? These and and it's so common today. I'll give you a good example. The last time I was in the U.S. was two uh, two summers ago. I was at the Necronomicon. The H.P. Lovecraft thing in, Bo in Providence in Rhode Island and I was coming home through, back to Ireland at Boston Airport, Logan <sighs> and I was in the in there's a bar cat, restaurant thing there and I went to get a burger while I was waiting for the plane and across from me there were two very obviously wealthy American white women early 20s who were knocking back $20 mixed drinks <laughs> ordering the most expensive thing on the menu dressed in designer fashions and you know when you can sort of tell when somebody comes from money it's it's, it's hard to put a finger on it but you just you just know you know yeah. you just know country club you know you just you just yeah. know right yeah. and these these two girls they weren't bothering me or anyone else they were but they just oozed that like oh yeah you know you know well healed and all they were talking about was how oppressed they were by trump Mm -hmm. and I can't wait to get out. I can't wait to get out of this country so I can get to Ireland and get away from this administration and get just a break from it. And it's like, you are probably among the most privileged people that has ever lived on the planet of the earth, on this planet, and you still fucking think you're oppressed. <laughs> and and feeding him because like right. with derangement. That way, you know. Yeah, but feeding him, not realizing he's like a a wonderkind chaos magician yeah. that doesn't even know what he's doing. You know what I mean? He's like the most <laughs> free of healing psycho. That's just like, it doesn't matter if it's the same on the bully at the playground as a kid, if we weren't kids. It's like, if you ignore him or you keep talking shit, hating him, it's the, or, or if you give him love, it's, it's, it's all a currency, right? And it's two sides, same coin, in my opinion, with someone like that. You know, when I saw when I saw Trump's famous speech in 2015, where he was talking about, you know, like it was some speech he made talking about like, and I was like, this guy is someone you need to stick your own charisma onto because he is yeah. a power force. Latch it, latch like right on. 
I like him. The fuck is fuck the politics. The hell with whatever he's into. He uh, owns that, it. Is, that is a powerful mm-hmm. spiritual charge that's now generating on the planet. You make sure to be on the right side of that. And that's why all they all went crazy when they anyone who resisted them fell apart. You know. Yeah. It in the derangement that comes from it. Like this is another side effect, symptom, whatever you want to call it, of what's going on just feeding into it. We can wrap in a couple seconds here, but I think it's like it's paramount to bring up and it's paramount to have tact when we discuss these things with people. I found that you can people that I would never think friends that I would never think, I mean, are asking more questions now. I mean, I'm, I'm happy they're coming around, but they've already gotten vaccinated or whatever you want to call it. So, I worry about these people. I worry about these friends. I really do. And we all have them in our families, whether we like it or not. It's just the way it is. So at the end, at the end of the day, it's it's their path, you know. Yeah. It's you know, it's it's unfortunate. I mean, I, it is. You know, I know a couple of cool people who who got the jabs, and I'm like, are they going to be? I hope they're okay. I hope they are. You know, but at the same time, too, it's like, it's uh, that's why I won't, I won't make fun of anyone who gets the vaccination. I won't do that because. It's it you know that's their own. Can you business. imagine living with that? You know what I mean, like having to also try you know, your, your husband or your, you know, oh Jesus Christ, it, it must be awful. Oh, my brain. I have a lot of sympathy for people who say their partner or their kids are getting oh, vaccinated dude. and they're not, and uh, you know, and you see things. There was a report on the on the, the UK news yesterday, some some awful magazine program, and and it says should you defre- should you unfriend everyone who's not in your life who's not vaccinated. That was the actual story. Yeah, that's going around here. Same thing. That was that's going around here. That was on mainstream. That was on mainstream, like morning TV, and they're, you know, unfriend the unvaccinated. I mean, they really are scum. These people, they really are evil. It's diabolical. It's so diabolical. Uh, yeah, that same thing's going on here. It's been going on here for a couple weeks. I mean, we've been seeing it here and there, scattered, but it's just, oh, it's, it's, it's messed up. So, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Seriously, Thomas. Really appreciate it. Pleasure to meet you. I yeah, mean, pleasure. Not oh, properly. Thank obviously. you so much for doing this. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, I like the range of questions. If you want me back, give me a shout. I'll be glad to come. That would be awesome, man. And awesome. this was basically mostly just conversation. Like, this is kind of how we roll. Yeah, just yeah, like... no, I, I watched I watched another one another one years uh, before I came on. I was look, just flicking through them. And I do like the conversation. Like we're all in the pub kind of style. I think it's very, it's healthy. Yeah, that's kind of like what, what we need it? that. We need, we need this kind of thing now, you know. Yeah, because I feel like it's a little bit too. They can be rigid for some people. You know what I'm saying? It's like this. I feel like this is like a hangout where it's okay to just come on. You know, let's just air it out, shoot the shit. Feels hey, do you do you have anything coming up? Like, do yeah. you have any? Let's get that anything in there. going on. That channel Beyond Room Three One Three. I'm really developing this now. And uh, I'm going to have a documentary in the process. It's on Sasquatch. We're going to be looking at the old Bigfoot thing from a different awesome. angle. And awesome. also in the same style as the Jack Parsons documentary. Oh, cool. And we're going to have, we're setting up a weekly news program, which will be kind of the, the Week in Strange, where any kind of strange news story will be reviewed. And we're also going to have a new discussion show that we're going to be interviewing a lot of people, some big names and some new names. So, uh, yeah, so that uh, this is where this is the gig I'm on now. Beyond Room Three One Three on YouTube. Uh, please subscribe to that channel and your listeners, and you won't be disappointed. There'll be lots of cool stuff coming up on it. The captain said.